Hi there, uh, my name is Jaden, which is the thing that you could actually Google for. Um, these are my things. Um, I'm going to talk about real-time geo APIs, uh, and I'm definitely coming from the JavaScript side more than the uh, geo side. Uh, I'm a civic hacker at Code for America this year, so I work with a lot of government data and a lot of open data, uh, and a lot of that has a geographic component to it, so I've had to kind of uh, develop any of my uh, GIS sensibilities in a just-in-time fashion. Uh, so apologies in advance if I don't know uh, your favorite projection. Uh, Web Mercator, all the things. Uh, so when you're dealing with things, it, it sometimes happens that they are related to real uh, objects uh, in the real world. Um, and they're located places, uh, oftentimes geographic places, uh, places that you can plot on a map. And they also happen at a certain point in time. When you combine these, uh, we have this sense of the immediate things that are happening uh, in, in our uh, surrounding environment. Uh, in 2014, we have this certain expectation that we're going to be able to have these remote senses by looking at our pocket supercomputers that are going to be able to tell us things uh, like when the space station is passing overhead or uh, if the bus coming down the street is going to be late and if you have time to run in and get an extra coffee. So how do you express these in an API? There's a couple of things that I look at as a developer uh, when I'm both creating APIs and, and consuming APIs of things that I uh, find highly desirable. Uh, one is I want them to use common formats. Uh, I want them to use simple protocols. I don't want them to be very surprising. In other words, that's me being lazy as a developer and saying it should just work. It should match my intuitive model of everything that I've uh, been using previously on the platform. Um, and the, the APIs should also understand uh, how people are going to be using the, the data or functionality exposed by these APIs. So in, in our case, for Geo APIs, a common format, uh, let's use GeoJSON. It's a thing, uh, it's, it's fairly well understood, it's supported by a broad number of tools, uh, at this point, in terms of protocols, uh, let's keep things simple. Let's use HTTP. Uh, everyone who develops on the web uh, has at least some understanding of it. Um, and then for real-time components, uh, let's just use the simplest thing possible in a plain text stream. Uh, there's a neat uh, protocol for that called server sent events, which uh, we'll look at in a second. Uh, in terms of the principle of least surprise, Wikipedia says that you should exploit users' pre-existing knowledge. Uh, and in the case of uh, updating points on a map, there's uh, this pattern called the general update pattern, uh, which you may have seen if you're familiar with D3. Um, I know Mark Offstock is talking at, at Phosphor-G, and that'll be a lot of fun. It also applies well towards uh, moving geo points around. So let's, let's unpack the general update pattern, um, and, and maybe you'll recognize it, and, and if not, then maybe uh, it'll be some cool new learning. But you have some things that you're modeling in your program, uh, and maybe they come into the world. Uh, and then maybe some of them leave, and then the ones that remain, uh, maybe something happens to them uh, over time. Uh, maybe they change color, they change position, some of the properties about these objects uh, change, and so you want to be able to update uh, and, and capture that information in your data model. So with that, we have uh, those three events. We have things entering, things exiting, and things changing. Uh, and we could apply those to other things in the world. Now, when we're building interactive applications, say in a web browser, um, we have a couple of, of well-known ways that we interact uh, with users. Uh, it might be a, a zoom, or a drag, or a, a click uh, event. And you just register event handling. So when any of these things happen and you're wanting to, to uh, update the map, maybe it's taken care of for you uh, by something like Leaflet, uh, or maybe you're adding custom handlers to react to, to that event. In terms of the other objects that you might want to interact with your program that aren't your user, we could also think in terms of their behaviors as actions that occur, as events. So uh, for a bus driving around the city, might be something like a bus starting a route and entering service. 
Uh, then the bus is gonna drive around the city for a little bit, go around the block. Uh, maybe some people get on, they get off the bus. Uh, maybe the bus is gonna stop at a red light, someone puts their bike on the bike rack. Uh, and then the driver goes home at the end of the day and the bus leaves service. Um, there's some cases where we might not have the data available uh, in, our, in our model. Uh, maybe there aren't sensors capturing this and so we can't use it um, in, in our application. Um, and maybe some things are just too noisy and we don't really need to care about it. Um, so what we're left with is a couple of events that uh, actually follow very well with the general update pattern. We have things uh, entering, things changing, and things exiting. The, the domain that our application cares about. So how can we get events like this into the browser so that we can do things with them? We want some way uh, to work with them just as easily as we do with click or touch events. We want some kind of event source. So there's a really cool uh, uh, DOM and API uh, that is in almost every browser, but very few people uh, use, I notice, and that's a shame. Um, there are polyfills that exist going back to IE8, so you could even use it in the government. Uh, but <laughs> this is how... Um, we had a request by somebody who works for the government to tone down our snark. <laughs> so I promised that person we'd make a good faith effort. Uh, so speakers this afternoon, please, please be respectful. So you can even use it in your large uh, uh, enterprise GIS shops. <laughs> that's good. That's good. This is how easy event source is to use, uh, which is why I love it, uh, versus some other technologies that you may think of uh, in terms of real time on the web. Um, web sockets are great, and they have their uses, uh, or things like socket IO. Uh, but in a case like this, where we literally just want a one-way continuous stream of events, and we want to treat them in our application as events, uh, I find something like socket IO to be more complex than is necessary. Um, you do this, you, you, you new up an event source object, uh, and you just point it at the endpoint for your event source API, uh, which is just going to be a regular HTTP service, um, and then you could use regular DOM add event listeners and give it whatever uh, handler function you want. So now we have a way to get events into the browser. Cool. Where do they come from? Uh, on the API side of things, what uh, is event source uh, doing? Is it making some restful HTTP requests for us? Is it, is it polling? What's going on here? So on the server side, um, it uses a serialization uh, framing uh, uh, protocol called server sent events. This is a, an excerpt from a valid server sent events stream. Uh, it's served with a mime type of um, uh, application event stream. It's just plain text uh, encoded, uh, please use UTF-8. Um, but the way it works is you have uh, events, and then a colon, and an event name, uh, data, a colon, and then this could be any string. Uh, in our case, we're gonna be using JSON, um, and in particular, GeoJSON. Uh, and then you just have a blank line in between, and then you could keep sending as many of these events as you want. Uh, it ends up being a persistent uh, HTTP request, in the event source spec, if for, uh, for whatever reason the connection is interrupted, it'll automatically handle your reconnection and, and retry logic for you. Um, what's really cool about this is that because it's so simple, you could implement it in any language uh, on any platform really easily. You could do it in PHP and just uh, uh, print to your output buffer. Um, whatever you want. You could actually just set up an HTTP server that's uh, listening and, and tailing a Unix file descriptor, if you want, and just write to it um, in C or, or, or whatever. Um, in, in my case, in the example, I'm using Node um, to, to spit this out, and I think there's like 100 event source libraries on NPM. The, um, the way that you make this is not necessarily... Um, relevant for the rest of the demo. So we're gonna just take that you have some API that's gonna be treating you uh, nicely and giving you events of GeoJSON features. 
So the rest of my talk is demo, so let's, let's do this. Let's build a bus map. Here are some of my friends from uh, Cascadia JS here in Portland uh, recently. Uh, I'm going to be using uh, NPM and just kind of showing my, my workflow for how I build maps, but it's not... Oh, and I'm also going to um, duplicate my screen. This is how I build maps uh, because I like to get to code uh, as quickly as possible, but you could do this um, uh, in a variety of ways. Much like a cooking show, you'd probably rather uh, see the useful bits than, than watch me type or chop onions, so... Uh, this is kind of our starting point. Um, this is actually just uh, one screen. Um, there's no vertical scrolling, and this is how uh, the, the level of code involved when I make maps. Um, can everyone see the text size? Okay, cool. I'm going to hide this real quick. Maybe, maybe not. Nope. Okay. How to you're using Linux, it's never happened. How, <laughs> how to computer. All right, all right. Um, so here's here's a text buffer. Uh, we're using Leaflet on NPM, and which means that we could just use uh, Common JS uh, require. Uh, if you're familiar with Ruby, uh, it's like require. If you're familiar with Python, it's like import. Um, other things have similar concepts. So we're getting Leaflet, which is the library itself, and then um, a, a wrapper module called Leaflet Map, which takes care of some of the boilerplate and will put it into an HTML page for you and just draw a full screen uh, web map. Um, here's the, the documentation for it, um, which is always great to look at. So what do we do? We get the map. We uh, add just a generic uh, OSM uh, base map tile layer. This is just copy and pasted from the getting started with OSM page. Uh, we have attribution to make OSM people happy. Um, and then we're just going to set the initial starting view to Chattanooga and add a marker. That doesn't sound too, too terribly difficult. Oh, no, let's skip that. Where are we? We're at JSGO. One C. All right, here we go. So the workflow is using uh, Browserify to kind of compile everything together into one package, and then this is just throwing it up in a web server. So now we can see that we have uh, the beautiful default OpenStreetMap styling of uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is where uh, I currently live. Uh, and we have our marker, and we can click on it, and it has the overlay, Chattanooga. Wonderful. All right, so that's step one. Step two, this is where we start to add uh, a couple of things. So we have all that stuff at the top still. Um, and now we're going to add our event source. This uh, URL uh, is Chawbus, which is the buses in uh, Chattanooga. This is an API that uses uh, kind of everything that we've just been talking about. It uses uh, event source. Uh, it's going to return GeoJSON features, uh, one per event. And uh, it calls the, the events from the general update pattern add, change, and remove. So at any given time, the buses that are driving around the streets have, um, uh, there's a certain set of, of vehicles that are driving the different routes. Uh, so it's just treating that as, um, uh, as a set. Now, the way that this API works, we could debug it uh, just using curl in our shell. So I'm just going to grab this URL. Curl is a Unix utility that will let you make an HTTP request and just watch the results in uh, your console. So when we first connected to it, uh, it replayed the current state of the set using add events so that we could handle everything uh, in a uniform fashion. And at this point, there have been so many other events happening. Uh, but as we watch this scroll by initially, you'll see that the event type um, is add events for the initial buses. And then... Uh, subsequently, there will be change events as the locations are changing. Um, 
This could potentially be a little bit uh, more efficient, but for the number of buses in uh, our set, it's not really a problem that we're repeating all of the properties uh, like color and, and route number. Um, even though the only thing that we really care about is the coordinates, the, the geometry of it. But we also get some other information which might be useful. For example, we have the heading. So we could say what direction it's pointing in. Uh, and so this is, this is it. This is a server sent event stream. Uh, we could log this to a file if we want. We could proxy this uh, anywhere. Um, and it's a lot easier to debug in this case than uh, WebSockets would be, for example. All right, so we've got that, and then we just add a couple of event listeners, and we have, um, we're just going to log it to the console and see what happens in our web browser. Uh, so we have the same map. Nothing's happening because we haven't done anything with the stream yet. But in the console, you notice that we have uh, all of these message events that um, are being logged. And so this is what the events look like um, on the DOM side of things that correspond to that service and event stream. Uh, if you're familiar with looking at raw DOM objects, uh, it looks very similar. Um, you have things like a target, but it's not really meaningful because it's, it's usually just the window. Um, so the important bits are you have the uh, event type, which in this case, it's the, the dispatch of that is already being handled for us because we wired it up to our on-change uh, event handler. Um, and then we have this data property. Uh, and you'll notice that it's still just a string because in server sent events, it doesn't uh, require it to be JSON or YAML or any other particular serialization. Uh, you get to, to deserialize the JSON uh, yourself. So that's all we're going to do when we're handling this. First, we're just going to do JSON.parse, uh, and then we'll have uh, our objects that we can look at. So in step three, we start to do something interesting with it. All of the setup stuff at the top is still the same. We have uh, our, our event listeners wired up. Um, and now let's do something in on add. Uh, so the first thing we're doing is parsing, just, just uh, uh, JSON parsing the data. Um, and then there's this weird kind of like quirk going between GeoJSON and, and Leaflet. Uh, in the, is it longitude and latitude? Is it latitude and longitude? X and Y, Z, beta, alpha, theta? Um, you know, whatever. So we're just gonna, gonna convert that and ignore that. Um, all right, so in our on add uh, handler, we're just parsing the incoming uh, JSON string into a JavaScript object. Then uh, we're creating a, a bus object um, in our application. So we're going to grab the ID just off of the GeoJSON feature ID, um, just because having identifiers is helpful in programming. Uh, data is just the raw GeoJSON feature. And then we're also going to um, create a leaflet marker uh, based on the, the geometry of the point from the feature. Um, one of the properties that we're getting back is the route, which is um, uh, just a domain property of what bus line that dot is on. Uh, and then we're going to add it to our map. So let's uh, run that. So here's our real-time API. It draws static points uh, in real time. Uh, and, and it's beautiful. And unfortunately, in 2014, we don't yet have the technology to animate things. So um, I've been thinking hard in advance of Steve's question, and I hope that in the future we'll be able to, to do that um, and, and show things moving. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm being facetious, so that's the obvious next step. Um, and let's look at what that looks like in our on-change uh, handler. So all of those were plotted from the, the um, initial connection when we get the add event, so when it's replaying back the current state of the set of all the buses that are driving around Chattanooga, Tennessee uh, right now. So the next thing that we want to do is listen to on change events. Um, so from the top here, we've got all the same setup. We're drawing our map. Um, I'm going to add a collection uh, just called buses, and I'm going to use a JavaScript object here uh, just as a, a collection indexed by the feature IDs. Um, and I'm going to throw it on the window uh, global object just so we could debug it in the console and kind of see what, what we have, what we're hanging on to. 
uh, on add is uh, the same, except we're also adding uh, the bus object that we created to our collection. In on change, uh, all we're doing here is we're parsing the incoming event. Uh, we are looking up the existing uh, bus object in our, our buses collection, because remember that also has the markers that we created on the map. Uh, and then we're just updating the position of the marker where it's drawn on the leaflet map with set lat long. And uh, GeoJSON geometry is still, uh, you know, the same. So now we have uh, all the markers, and every couple of seconds when the, the um, underlying data source is updated, we'll see these markers start to move. Um, and it's subtle, so let me zoom in. Um, actually, that's as much as that'll let me zoom in on this layer. Can anyone see that, maybe? Yeah. All right. So when you're zoomed at, like, zoom level 9 or whatever this is, uh, <laughs> driving at bus speed is, is pretty slow. And you have experienced this... <laughs> You've experienced this if you've been waiting for a bus to arrive. Um, so this is the simulated version. But now we have, we have dots moving around um, on a map. And there are maybe a couple of more uh, things that, that you could do. Um, how do I... Computer. A um, couple other things you could do if you have a, a feed of, of bus locations or really any other kind of location. This is the unscripted bit. Um, but here's an example of something that I made. Um, using this same data feed. This is the, the bus driver simulator uh, 2000. And so this is where we're using that heading information. Is where uh, we're using the Google Maps API uh, to show street view image <laughs> corresponding to the current location of the bus. <laughs> And so that'll update. And so we could switch around to all the different buses that are currently driving around uh, in Chattanooga. <laughs> With, without the steering wheel and the windshield, it just wouldn't have quite the same effect. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you noticed, because we built that in. We have this, this realism slider here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, not a plant. <laughs> Keanu Reeves, Sandra Bullock, this is hot. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that's, that's an example of, of what we've got. And just uh, to jump back to the slides really quick. PowerPoint, Mark, GIS, GO, Bingo. <laughs> yeah, but it's PowerPoint version Dang like command Windows line. 8. <laughs> how to computer? How, how to scroll on a, on a list? <laughs> oh, yeah. This is all we have. Attribution, it's important, it matters. Uh, there were, there were e e even when your images don't load, um, in theory there were images from the noun project. Uh, squares were designed by like Archimedes or Pythagoras or someone like that. Um, and then all the material and demos and code and stuff that I did in this talk are uh, in the public domain uh, under the terms of Creative Commons Zero uh, stuff. So, I'll take one question exactly. Question from the audience. Archimedes and uh, Pythagoras are giving a presentation later in the week. Anyone? Why do you think that like that? <laughs> how, much, how much time? Yes, sir! <laughs> So, um, so when when I first started using it, sorry, let me do this. Um, I was looking for for why that is, right? And so the first thing I thought of was, well, maybe it's not really widely supported uh, in in web browsers. Oh, here's my my animated GIF. <laughs> uh, this is the, the browser support uh, matrix from, from caniuse.com. Um, and so we could see that except for in, in old Android browsers, 
Um, and then this other column uh, on the left-hand side, um, <laughs> it's, it's supported everywhere. Uh, and in Internet Explorer, like I said, there's actually a really good polyfill going back to, to um, IE8, and I, I think in theory it would support earlier things. And again, it's just because it's such a simple text uh, stream to parse. And um, the, the cool thing is that IE actually has, um, because they have a, a different implementation of XML HTTP requests, they have better uh, streaming support. And so um, someone basically just wrote a JavaScript parser for service and events. So, so we can use it actually um, with, with polyfills. I think this whole thing turns green. I'm not positive about Opera Mini. Um, so it's supported everywhere that we would need it to use. Why don't people use it? I think so much mind share uh, as like the, the word real time started picking up steam went to web sockets that um, that just kind of took the spotlight. Um, web sockets are hard to implement if you're writing a server. Like no one implements their own web socket server. Everyone just uses one that exists. Um, which is fine, but it means that there's less, less tooling available, and if you're um, adding it to maybe an existing project, that might be more difficult. Or if there's existing hosting infrastructure, for example, because WebSockets um, use an upgrade from regular HTTP, they use some, some clever tricks in the protocol, um, but some corporate firewalls, for example, don't actually play nicely, and you have connection issues. And then you end up with, with libraries like Socket.io that uh, try to do WebSockets and have all these horrible fallbacks. Um, at the end of the day, like, think about what it is that you actually need uh, streaming for. Sockets are great if you actually need bidirectional communication. Right? If you're writing a game, uh, you want persistent kind of stateful sockets uh, so that both the server and the client are kind of aware of what's going on on the other end. Um, in this case, and in a lot of cases, uh, where you're just pushing information one way, uh, all you really need is a way to kind of continue sending updates instead of in a request response model. So for that, I would say uh, event source and, and service and events are great, and why don't more people use them? Um, well, now you all know about them, and you all should <laughs> use them, because they're, they're well specified, and they're well supported, and they're really simple. I like that. Let's give it a hand.